our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and glory forever and ever. Amen. All right. Well, good morning, Woodland. It is good to be back here today. Uh, my name is Ken Gilmore, and I'm the interim teaching pastor here at Woodland. And last week, I uh, was supposed to be here, uh, but unfortunately, it was down and out. And uh, thankful, thank you for your prayers and for uh, lifting my wife and I up. Uh, we both are on the road to recovery, which is amazing and feels fantastic. So thank you for your prayers. Also, thank you to Pastor Devin for your message last week. Uh, that was just great. It was great to sit back and listen to a message that I kind of had in mind and then just hear him share it uh, with such passion and such clarity and uh, just incredible. And so thank you, Pastor Devin, for that. That was awesome. Today we are wrapping up our series called Prayer. And what we've been doing in this series is, is we've been looking at the Lord's Prayer, the words he taught us to pray, and also the pattern that he taught us to pray. And so what we've been doing is in each and every part of this series, each and every week, we've been looking at different aspects of what we know as the Lord's Prayer, which honestly, if we want to accurately title it, it's the Disciples' Prayer. Because it's a prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. It isn't the prayer that Jesus himself would pray because Jesus didn't need to pray for forgiveness. And so it's a prayer that Jesus taught us. And so it's a prayer that we pray. And the words that Jesus taught us to pray are found in Matthew chapter 6. Uh, it's in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And this is what Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, what's, you know, as we wrap up, we're going to be looking at the last few words of the prayer. Now, for, for those of you who grew up in a Protestant tradition, uh, English-speaking tradition, when I say we're going to talk about the last words of the Lord's Prayer, chances are you're thinking what I'm thinking, and that's the part that I grew up saying, for thine is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever. Amen. Right? I mean, that is the, the last line of the prayer. Uh, I, I grew up in a church where we used the King, Jer, Jer, King James version of the Bible, and in the King James part of Matthew chapter 6, you get to the end of the prayer, that's what you find. It's called the doxology. And, you know, doxology is just a fancy word. Doxa means glory. Logos is, is a spoken word. And so it's just spoken glory. And when you close the prayer, typically, if you are, like I said, of a Protestant tradition, you tend to close the prayer the way the King James Version wrote it. And that's saying, you know, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And yet, if you go into the New International Version of the Bible or some of the more modern translations of Scripture, you're going to get to the end of Matthew chapter 6, verse 13, and you're not going to find that doxology. You're not even going to find an amen at the end of the prayer. And yet, it's our tradition to say that. So where does that tradition come from? Like, is it right for us to add to the words of Jesus? Now, the first thing I have to say is you have to be really, really careful when you're talking about, well, that's not really praying the words Jesus taught us to pray. The thing is, is Jesus, you know, Jesus, when he would talk, very likely Jesus could speak Greek. You know, it was the common language. He grew up in Nazareth in the northern part of Israel. Lots of intermingling and intermixing of cultures there. Jesus was a stonemason or a carpenter. He likely spoke the common language to do business, which was Greek. Jesus also most likely spoke Aramaic because anytime we're seeing a quote of Jesus in the New Testament, very often it's in Aramaic. He also spoke Hebrew. We're not told what language Jesus used to teach us to pray but it was translated into Greek. Most likely it was Hebrew or Aramaic, translated into Greek, and then ultimately translated to English. So when you are praying the words of the Lord's Prayer in English, you are already playing, praying a translation of a translation. 
Right, so understand that when you know, people get so hung up, like, oh no, you know, it's not, oh, it's, those aren't words that Jesus taught us in, in the scriptures, so maybe we shouldn't say those words. No, it is a fine tradition. As a matter of fact, some of the ancient manuscripts have that doxology in there. It's just that the oldest documents, the oldest translation that we have doesn't include that. And so the question becomes, okay, so is it right to say it? Yes, it is okay to say that. You know, it actually, you go back and there's a, a document called the Didache. And it was a document that was written probably around 90 AD. So really early in the history of the church. And it was describing how the church practiced communion, how the church practiced baptism. And in the midst of that document, it lists the Lord's Prayer. And do you know how it ends? It ends with the doxology. And so it was already a tradition that the church had established that, yeah, we were going to add this ending to the prayer, which is perfectly appropriate. Don't, don't get too hung up and thinking, oh, no, am I praying? The, you know, it's not like God's in heaven saying, nope, nope, you added the end. Sorry, I can't hear your prayer. That's not the way it works. As a matter of fact, the, what's conveyed in that doxology is something you find all over Scripture. When, when, the, when, the, when, the, when King David you know, when he established all the resources needed for Solomon to build the temple for God, because David couldn't, he had, he had blood on his hands. And so God says, no, you're not building my temple. He said, all right, well, then I'll gather the resources so that my son can. And when all of the resources came in, David offers a prayer to God and listen to the elements of this prayer and just tell me if they sound familiar. You know, because you find it in the book of Chronicles. This is a... Uh, if you guys could go to the, there you go, here it goes. It says, praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands, strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. So you can hear the elements of the prayer right there, even in the prayer of David. And so what I'm trying to say is, is yes, it's important for us to understand what Jesus taught us to pray. It is not inappropriate for us to add the doxology to it. So when I pray the Lord's Prayer, I add the doxology. It, it's, it's, not a, it's not a question of right or wrong. It's actually appropriate for us to convey a message to God. And so when I talk about, we're going to look at the last few lines, I'm not talking about that part of it. Today, we're going to look at the lines that Jesus taught us to pray that say, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Can you say that with me? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is a very fascinating thing that Jesus asks us to pray because Jesus knows something about us. As a matter of fact, I know something about you and I don't even know you, but I know this is true about you. The truth about you is you have experienced temptation, right? You have experienced temptation. Every single person who's listening to the sound of my voice, whether you're in the room or online, you have experienced and faced temptation. Here's something else that I know about you, and I don't know you, but I know this about you. <laughs> You've given in to temptation too. You have. As a matter of fact, I think, I think like, like New Year's resolutions are built on people giving in to temptation. Because for so many of us, we make a decision at the new year. You know what? I'm going to turn a new page. I'm going to start a new habit. I'm going to do this new thing. And here's the thing. You break your own rule that you set up for your benefit. I mean, think about that. How crazy is that? That you know what's good and you even decide, hey, I'm going to do this because this is just going to be a healthier way to live. It's going to be better for me. And then what do you do? You face temptation and you fall. And then you're like, oh man, what is wrong with me? As a matter of fact, I think there's a, there's a good reason why a lot of us show up at church each and every week. And part of it's because we know there's something wrong in here. Because we know the good we ought to do and we don't do it. We even set our own rules, let alone the rules that get set for us. When we set our own rules about our lives, we fail. 
And then we go, man, there is something wrong on the inside of me that, that has to be addressed. And so it, what, it, what it does is it drives us to go, okay, God, what is going on here? Because we struggle with temptation. We do. There, there's a story of a guy who, who was, you know, wanting to start new patterns or whatever, but, you know, his habit every day was to drive by the same bakery, get a large cup of coffee and a box of donuts, and then, you know, kind of eat the donuts, bring them to work, share, and all that. But uh, he was just like, man, this is a habit I've got to change. So he said, all right, I know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to change the way I drive to work so I don't even drive by that bakery anymore. And so that's what he did. And for months, he's been doing this. Then one day, he shows up at work with a large coffee and a big box of donuts. And all of his workmates are like, oh no, Bob, what are you doing? Like you, you've been doing so well. And he goes, oh no, 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 no. You need to understand this is a special box of donuts. They said, oh really, a special box of donuts? He goes, yeah, yeah. I was going my alternate route to work. There was an accident. And so I had a detour and ended up going on my old way to work. And as I was driving by the bakery, there was this box of donuts in the window. And I just looked at those donuts and I was just like, all right, God, if you want me to have those donuts, let there be a parking space right in front of the window. And he said, wouldn't you know it, on my eighth time around the block, there was. <laughs> because that's us, isn't it? And you know what? It's funny when it's donuts and a diet. It's just not so funny when it's a commitment that we make to our spouse, when it's a commitment we make to our kids or to our boss. It's all, it's all funny when it's New Year's resolutions, but it's not so funny when we give into the temptation to lie, when we give into the temptation of making another human being a commodity for our pleasure or an outlet for our abuse. It's a whole other thing when we begin to shift and we're not talking about diets and we're not talking about New Year's resolutions we're talking about behavior that hurts another human being. Now all of a sudden, the stakes change and things get more serious. And we have to understand that Jesus takes this prayer that he teaches us to pray and 25% of the prayer is dedicated to this proposition and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one because Jesus understands what's at stake for us and it isn't fun and games and it isn't silly little sins it is something far more serious because when it comes to temptation you need to understand this when it comes to the temptation to sin the stakes are always higher than we realize when it comes to the temptation for us to sin, the stakes are always way higher than we realize. Because the Apostle Paul would say this, when he was talking about sins, when he was talking about the consequences or what the payment is for sin, do you know what he says? He says in Romans chapter 6, 23, for the wages of sin is what? Death. Death, that's not kidding. You're not kidding around. The Apostle Paul's not, the wages of sin is a little bit of discomfort, a little bit of shame, a little embarrassment. No, he says the wages of sin, the consequence to giving into temptation, do you know what that is? It's death. And it's not death sometimes. It's death every time. You need to let that sink in. That's part of the reason Jesus taught us to pray. Lead us not to temptation because the stakes are high. When it's, the, when it's a question of life or death, my whole demeanor shifts. Anybody here ever jumped out of an airplane with a parachute on their back? I mean, okay, good for you, crazy people. All right, I am sorry. You know, my wife did that in college. I couldn't believe, when she told me, I was like, are you crazy? Like for me, even if I'm on a plane that's on fire, I'm going to be like, I'm going to give it a chance to land, all right? Because the idea of jumping out of a plane is not where you're supposed to be. You know, a couple years ago, 2016, do you remember the guy who jumped out of a plane without a parachute at all? And he jumped into a net 
He, he leapt out of a plane at 25,000 feet and landed in a net. I am never breaking that record. That's never going to happen. Do you know why? Because to me, I understand the consequences. That's a life or death thing, and I am not playing around with that. And yet, how many of us play around with temptation? Not realizing that we're dealing with a life or death situation. Instead, we worry about embarrassment. We worry about being, you know, kind of exposed. And yet, it is a life or death scenario. And if you don't believe that it is, look at the very first temptation you ever come across in the scriptures. When Adam and Eve are in the garden and God has given them everything they need, they had one rule. Can you imagine living your life by one rule? We would love to have one rule. They had one rule, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was their rule. And where does the temptation come? Around the one rule. We're told that the serpent, the Nahash, shows up and this is what we read. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not, must not touch it or you will die. What does, what was, what's the very next thing the devil says? You will certainly, you will not certainly die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Notice the very first thing that the tempter wants to do is to remove that whole death thing. Oh, no, no, the wages of sin isn't death. No, 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 no. You will not certainly die. Do you see the game he's playing here? He's trying to say, oh, no, 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 no. It's not that dire. It's not that big of a deal. Don't, don't be one of those religious people who make it a big deal. And yet, what happens when Adam and Eve take a bite? What happens? Immediately, God says, that's it. They're out. I can't let them in this state, in this rebellious, fallen state, I can't let them keep eating from the tree of life because then they'll be stuck that way eternally. So what does God do? He kicks them out of the garden. And now the work that they have to do to get their food, it says they will, they will, they will eat with like kind of like the sweat of their brow. That doesn't just mean they have to work hard. That's a sense of anxiousness. Like the crops better not fail this year because if they do, we're in trouble. And so it leaves them with this sense of fighting against death because it's a consequence to sin. What happens in the next few chapters? Even before Adam and Eve experienced death, what do they get to experience? They get to experience the death of their child by their other child's hand. Because the wages of sin is death. And we're introduced to it immediately. And it isn't funny. And it isn't light. It is serious business. Which is why Jesus says, oh, if you're gonna pray anything, make sure that you pray and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, when Jesus teaches us to pray, he teaches us to pray to our heavenly father and we're to ask our heavenly father not to lead us into temptation. Now, for some of you who, who know your scriptures, who are familiar with your New Testament, you might be jumping ahead to the book of James. Because if you look in the book of James, James, the brother of Jesus, writes a letter to the churches. And in his letter, this is what he writes in James chapter one, starting with verse 13, he says, and when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after 
desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to what? That, do you hear a pattern here? Do you see something that the scriptures are trying to communicate to us that I don't think we often understand because we tend to believe our enemy who says, oh, you certainly won't die. No, it leads to death. Now the question is, is if God isn't tempted and doesn't tempt anyone, then why does Jesus tell us to pray to our Father, lead us not into temptation? Well, the reason that Jesus says that isn't because God is the one who is going to tempt us, but when it comes to our lives, our heavenly father is sovereign. That means there is not something that comes into your life that God does not have the ability to control. All right? And Jesus says, make sure you go to your father and you ask God, lead me not into times of temptation. Now, I've heard some teachers who kind of modify and say, God, don't lead us into times of testing, All right? And, and it doesn't have that same negative connotation as temptation. Now, I, I honestly think that's softening it too much because in this prayer, Jesus says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So I, I think temptation is the better translation here because it has something to do with the evil one's intention in our lives. And we are to ask God not to lead us into temptation. In other words, God, lead us out of temptation. Lead us away from temptation. Now, Jesus ought to know that that's an important prayer. Why? Because if you go back in the Gospel of Matthew, you know, Matthew chapter one is Jesus' lineage and the announcement of his birth. Chapter two is when he's born and the Magi come to visit. Chapter three is when he's baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist. And God, you know, he comes up out of the water and it says that God descends on him as the Holy Spirit as a dove. And God says, this is my son in him. I am well pleased. And then what happens in Matthew chapter four? Matthew chapter four, starting with verse one, it says, then Jesus was what? Led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Not to be tempted by God, but to be tempted by the devil. When Jesus says, lead us not into temptation, he knows that because he knows what it is to be led to those moments of testing and temptation because he was. And you read the rest of chapter four, and Jesus and the temptation that he faces during that time, I tell you, it's amazing. If you look at the temptation that Jesus experienced in chapter four, you're gonna find elements in those temptations that Jesus puts in the Lord's prayer. Because he says, the devil says to Jesus, if you are the son of God, Jesus tells us, when you pray, pray to your father in heaven. You don't have to question your relationship with him. He says, oh, why don't you turn these stones to bread. Jesus says, when you pray, pray, Lord, give us today our daily bread. He tells Jesus, why don't, why don't you force God's hand? Why don't you establish your own kingdom by my authority? What does Jesus do in the prayer? He says, oh, no, 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 your kingdom come, your will be done. It's almost as if Jesus is saying, listen, the devil doesn't have any new tricks. So be proactive when you pray to begin to head off the temptations that are gonna come your way. Jesus knew what it was to face temptation, but here's the great news about Jesus. We read about it in Hebrews chapter four, verse 15. It says, for we do not have a high priest, speaking of Jesus, who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but he, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. He did not sin. We, were, we know what it's like to give in. Jesus never did. He never did. We are the ones who need strength to face these temptations. We're the ones who ought to pray, oh, Father, leave me not into temptation. Jesus, when he was 
praying in the garden of Gethsemane. He was crying out to God at the night before his crucifixion. And he's saying, Lord, if at all possible, take this cup from me. But if not, your will be done. When he was praying, he kept going back to his disciples. And here he is screaming prayers of agony. And what are his disciples doing? Anybody know? Sleeping. Sleeping. And Jesus comes over to them and says, and what does he say to him? He says, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I tell you, if there's a shirt we need printed up and if there's a bumper sticker we need on our car, it is the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak because that's who we are. We have this willingness and this desire and yet our flesh is weak. Jesus tried to convey this to his disciples in another gospel, Luke chapter 22. He's talking to Simon Peter and he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. What was Peter's response to Jesus? You don't even have to know Peter and you pretty much can guess what Peter says. Because Peter says, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Fact check, false. Because you know what happened? When faced with prison and with death, you know what Simon did? He failed. He failed. His flesh was weak. And instead of saying to Jesus, thank you, Jesus, I needed that information. Thank you. I'll pray that God will give me the strength to stand up. Instead, he says, no, 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 Jesus. No, I'll be there. I'll go to prison and to death with you. Until it came to prison and death. Then the the flesh failed. But here's the amazing thing. Simon Peter's flesh failed, but his faith ultimately didn't. Because Jesus prayed that it wouldn't. And, and, And what does Peter do? He eventually turns back. Yeah, he experienced failure. We experience failure. Faith isn't about, well, I'm never going to fail. No, faith is about, yeah, even in my failure, I'm going to turn to the one who forgives. Even in my failure, I'm going to turn to the one who can give me strength so that I can face the temptations that are ahead of me. Jesus taught us to pray and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It tells us two things we're gonna need. That means we need both. We need both guidance and deliverance. We need God to guide us out of areas of temptation and we need his deliverance for the times we don't make it out. That God, you would help rescue us from the evil one. We need both guardrails and a rescuer because we know what we do with guardrails. We climb them. We cross them. And Jesus gives us both in one prayer. Why? Because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's who we are. And that's why Jesus teaches us to pray this way. Now, the beautiful thing about Jesus is he doesn't leave us alone in this this fight, in this challenge. Hebrews chapter two, verse 18 says, because he, Jesus himself, suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. There is only one person in the history of humanity who withstood temptation and his name is Jesus. Oh, good news, he's in our corner. He's the one who by his spirit says, I can help. If you would make it a regular prayer, God, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from the evil one. The apostle Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 as he's writing to the church in Corinth. He says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you compare. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you 
can endure it. Now, I think it's really important. This is, this is one of my pet peeves. It does not say God will not give you more than you can bear. All right, do you understand that? If you're, if you're the kind of Christian who wants to encourage somebody and you want to take somebody who's going through a difficult time and say, oh, it's okay, God will never give you more than you can bear. False, not true. God will never let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. There is a difference. There are plenty of things we are given that we do not have the strength to carry. That's why God has given us each other. That's why groups that they talked about earlier are so critical. Because there are events coming in your life you are not designed to handle on your own. And if anybody says, oh, God won't give you more than you can bear, that is no encouragement to you who can't bear it. What this scripture says is, God won't let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but will always provide a way out. Why? Because we're the kind of people who pray, lead me not to temptation, but deliver me from the evil one. Because God wants us to find rescue and deliverance in him. He wants to free us from temptation. This is a promise that we're given. The question is, is do we even bother praying this? Or do we pray it simply, we say the words because those are the words we're supposed to say? Or do we really mean, wait, God, I understand the consequence here is life and death. And I'm not playing around with that. And so, yeah, I'm gonna take these words seriously. And when I'm confronting with, confronted with temptation, I'm gonna work hard to not listen to the devil who says, certainly you won't die. But I'm gonna take it for the life and death situation. It really is. Now, this can feel heavy, right? I don't know about you, but it feels heavy. That doesn't mean it's not true. Because I think for so many of us, we, we face temptations and it feels to us like we're gonna cheat on our diet and the consequences are so much higher. Which is why when the Apostle Paul was, was concluding his letter to the church in Ephesus, he says this, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, and it will, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray. I love this. It says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. And what should we be praying for all the Lord's people? What is a prayer that we could be praying for our brothers and sisters in Christ? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. You do realize that when Jesus taught us to pray this prayer, it's a corporate prayer. This is meant to be a prayer that we pray, not just for me, but for we. That it is a community prayer that we pray this for each other and with each other to support each other. Because there are gonna be times you're not wrestling with the certain temptation, but they are. And they need your prayers. Your brother or sister in Christ needs you to pray for them. You know, we, we just went through the remembrance 20 years ago of 9-11. 
And I don't know about you, but you know, all the different specials and different things people have been posting, it, it, was, it was impossible to, to go through yesterday without seeing some of that material. And I don't know if you guys remember the guy named Todd Beamer. Anybody remember him? He was a guy on flight 93. And uh, it was the flight, it was the last flight um, that was still in the air that was hijacked. And he was talking with the operator and at, at some point, you know, he's, he's talking about, you know, the, what's happened and how the hijackers took over the plane. And you could hear, you know, the woman talking to him and she was just struggling because she knew what was really going on. And you could tell there was finally a point where she had to say to him, listen, it's worse than you think. Because these hijackers, they're not just taking the planes. And they're telling you one thing, but their plan is to actually crash these planes into populated areas because they've already crashed them into the Twin Towers and they've already hit the Pentagon. And they're turning your plane around because they're taking yours to DC. And he just, uh, you could just feel the brokenness and the fear. And he begins to talk them through and he says, all right, tell my wife I love her. Tell my kids I love them. He says, we're gonna try to come up with a plan. And then he talks to an FBI agent and the FBI agent's like, listen, the, the hijackers have turned your plane east. You are going around Pittsburgh right now. You're about 20 minutes from DC. He said, all right, then we've got to, we're going to do something to stop this from happening. And so they had their plan together and he and a group of passengers, along with some stewardesses, were getting ready to do what they needed to do. And do you know what he did next? He asked the operator to pray with him. Do you know what they prayed? Lord's Prayer, this prayer. They prayed, Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Then he said the famous words, let's roll. And in that moment, if you really consider what happened, because they stormed that, that cockpit, we are not exactly sure all that took place. What we do know is that plane never made it to Washington, D.C. It crashed in a field in Pennsylvania. And on that day, in that situation, from that plane, there were many people who were delivered from evil. There were many people who were on the ground in DC who would have experienced the evil intended, intended on them. Yet there were some believers who were willing to pray together. Lead us not in a temptation, but deliver us from evil. The question is, is are we people who are praying this for each other? Because for some of us, we're in a hijacked plane of our lives and we're calling out and we need somebody to pray with us. The words Jesus taught us to pray. And so I wanna close this morning and ask and invite you to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. And I don't want you to pray this for you. You're included, but I want you to pray this for those around you because God has given us to each other so that we can be here to pray these kind of prayers that actually make a difference 
in our lives and in the lives of those around us. And so join me as we pray. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Lord, thank you. Thank you for teaching us to pray. Thank you for leaving us an example of not only words to say, but Lord, a pattern to pray. And Lord, help us take the last part of that prayer more seriously than we do. To understand that when we're talking about temptation, we're talking about life and death decisions. Help us to choose life. Help us to listen to your leading. That you would lead us away, out from, and show us the escape from temptation. And that Lord, you would deliver us from the one who wants to destroy our souls and destroy our world, who wants to bring death. Lord, I pray that just as you have overcome the grave, you would help us to be people who bring life. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.